Good to see everyone this morning. Let's, uh, as we begin our worship service together, let's uh, bow in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for all that you do for us, and we especially thank you that we can be here together in your house worshiping you and singing your praises, God. So bless us once again with your presence, Lord. Let us feel your spirit uh, this morning in this service and, and speak to our hearts as you always do. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you were breathing over me been so so kind to me been 
so, so kind to me.
toward the back of the sanctuary. Miss Tabitha is back there to greet you and to uh, take you down to children's worship. I have a uh, Bible app on my phone that I use a lot. I use uh, in, uh, for uh, when we're in staff meetings and a question comes up about Scripture or we're doing a devotion. I use it a lot at this service. And I don't know what's going on with this app, but it is out to get me because it used to work so well. And now for the last several weeks, right before I get up, I open it and I get right to the verse and when I stand up here, I kid you not, I stand up here and every time it is in an entirely different place in the Bible than where I just pulled it up. And so I think the devil has gotten in my phone and is messing with that Bible app. <laughs> uh, Pastor Teresa is not uh, here today. Obviously, she is, um, she's been down in classes all week uh, at Duke. Uh, she'll be back in the office on Tuesday. Um, but yesterday she uh, texted me, sent me a picture um, and she was uh, at, a, at a very important part of our theological training at Duke. She was, uh, the picture was uh, her attending a Duke basketball game yesterday afternoon. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, I invite you to hear these words from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 29 through 44, uh, 42. 
The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. And now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will speak through me, Lord, if necessary, in spite of me and always beyond me, that your message will be brought to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. For most of us, when we think of having an epiphany, we, we typically think of having uh, an aha moment, right? When we talk about uh, an epiphany, we think of one of those aha moments. We think of a, of a sudden insight, a moment of truth, something that caused us to change our life for the better or at the very least caused us to make a difficult decision. You know, I was driving home from work last night and I had an epiphany. This thing that I'd been struggling with for weeks suddenly became clear and I knew what to do. I had an epiphany. Unfortunately, not everyone's epiphany has that effect. I was reading about a man by the name of Jack Welch. Don't know if you, rec- don't know if you recognize that name or not. Welch is the former CEO, the former CEO of General Electric. And GE was very successful under his leadership. And the company paid him hundreds of millions of dollars for his leadership. He also got the free use of a luxury corporate apartment in New York City that rented for, wait for it, $80,000 a month. Also a corporate jet and free courtside tickets to every game, every professional game in town. In 1995, he underwent some major Uh, heart, open heart surgery, and just after the surgery, a reporter was there talking with him, and he asked him if he had had any epiphany moments during this period, as he must have considered his, his own mortality during that process. And he replied that, yes, in fact, he did have an epiphany through that process. He said, I realized one day that I haven't spent enough money. That was his epiphany. I didn't spend enough money. This great leader, this multimillionaire's big epiphany was, I don't think I spent enough money. And so he vowed from that day on that he would never drink a bottle of wine that cost less than $100. Now, that definition of an epiphany moment is not what most of us think of when we think of an epiphany. It's not my definition of an epiphany moment. I doubt that's your definition of an epiphany moment. It is certainly not God's definition of an epiphany. Because I believe that when God blesses you with a moment of truth about your life, it should not only change you, but it should open up a new life for you. 
a life that blesses those around you. In Matthew's gospel, we read the first encounter between John and Jesus when they both started their public ministries. And John announced that Jesus uh, would, uh, was one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He announced Jesus as the Messiah who would separate the righteous people from the unrighteous people. And you remember John was one of those fire and brimstone preachers, right? He put the fear of God, as we say, into people through his preaching. He told the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, don't think this message doesn't apply to you. You need to get over here and repent and be baptized as well. John was a little rough around the edges, as we read in scriptures. Uh, That's putting it mildly. He was a little rough around the edges. But his message was honest and direct, and it was simply this. Repent or else. Repent or else. But then notice this. John's preaching in this this passage for this morning seems to do a 180-degree turn as we look at our lesson from John's gospel that says, the next day John was coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John has been preaching up to this point, John has been preaching fire and brimstone. But suddenly here in John's gospel, when he sees Jesus, he all of a sudden becomes a preacher of grace. Not fire and brimstone, but now a preacher of grace, God's loving kindness toward humanity. John the Baptist's focus has been on the avenging Messiah who would send the non-repentance to fire and torment, but now his focus is on the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, these are two very different images of God. And so it's possible, it's possible that this was John's epiphany moment. In this moment, John saw humanity's greatest problem, sin, and he saw God's awesome solution in Jesus Christ. And he wanted everyone who heard his message to see that as well. And so this morning, For the next few moments, I'd like us to look at how seeing God more clearly can give us an epiphany moment that changes our life for the better. First of all, in his epiphany, John saw just how far sin has taken us away from the presence of God. Just how far sin has separated us from God's presence. Now, I realize we don't talk about sin very much anymore. It's, it's such an old-fashioned word. It's such an old-fashioned thing. We, we may call it by other names, in fact, instead of using that word sin. But no one really talks about sin anymore, and I wonder why not. Because after all, when you get right down to it, sin is the very thing that separates us from God, right? Why doesn't that terrify us? God is life. Okay, God is life. Without God, life ceases to exist. If you were separated from air, you would die. If you were separated, um, if you didn't get food and water over, the, over a period of time, you would die. These are necessary things for human life. And God, likewise, is the source of spirit life of soul life, of eternal life. And separation from God is death. Separation from God is spiritual death. That's the predicament that we are all in as as human beings. That's the situation that humanity finds itself in. But we don't see the true nature of sin. We don't see how terribly dead we already are. See, we have to remember, Jesus didn't come just to clean us up and make us shinier uh, versions of ourselves. Jesus came to raise us from the grave. Why? Because we were already dead in our 
sins. We were dead, already dead in our sins. And Jesus came to raise us from the grave. Here's something something interesting. Uh, one of the most popular phone apps, you can go into, you go into your phone, uh, go into the app store. One of the most popular phone apps in the health and fitness category is an app called We Croak. We Croak. Its only purpose is to pop up a reminder. In fact, I had one uh, about an hour ago. It's not still on there. It pops up a reminder five times a day that you're going to die. Now, when you click on that, you go to some quote from a famous person that is supposed to kind of uh, be a, a motivational quote. But the first thing that it says on these, on these reminders, you're going to die. Don't forget, you're going to die. Now, do we really need an app to remind us of that? I, I thought that's kind of thought that's what the process of aging did for us as a reminder. You know, you wake up uh, today, your neck hurts, and you wake up tomorrow and your neck doesn't hurt, but now your back hurts, and the next day it's the knee, and it's like, oh yeah, that's right, I'm mortal, I'm going to die someday. I thought that's what the process of aging did for us. So a phone app can remind us, a phone app can remind us that we will physically die someday. Okay, but here's the thing, the cross The cross reminds us that we were already dead. We were already dead, eternally dead, before we met Jesus Christ. That's what we just finished celebrating at Christmas, that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, had come, that that God had come in the form of Jesus Christ to save us from that eternal death. And the cross serves as a reminder of that. John saw the destructive power of death looming over all of us. And he realized how urgently he needed to point people to Christ. And so in his epiphany, John saw just how far sin had taken all of us away from the presence of God. But the next thing that John also saw was how far God would go to bring us back. Look, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John's, you have to realize now, in that day and time, people hearing those words that John said would have been shocked by that language. Lamb of God. Hearing John say, look, the Lamb of God they would have been shocked by those words because if you go back 3,000 years, the people of Israel are living as slaves in Egypt. And on the night before he sets the Israelites free from slavery, God announces that every Israelite household should take an unblemished, perfect lamb from their flock and sacrifice it. And then the blood of that lamb was to be spread over and around the doorway of each Israelite home. And that night, all of the firstborn males of every household in Egypt died. But in the homes that were protected by the blood of the perfect lamb, no one died that night because death had passed over their home. That's where we get Passover, the Jewish tradition of Passover from. The lamb, you see, was viewed as completely innocent. Its physical perfection made it extremely valuable as an object of trade. Well, in like manner, Jesus was also completely innocent. Even in his humanity, he never sinned. He lived in complete devotion and submission to the will of God. And so his spiritual perfection... Jesus' spiritual perfection made him extremely valuable for a trade, so to speak. Just like that lamb, Jesus was the lamb of God. Jesus was very valuable for a trade. Trade his life for all of ours. That's what he did. He traded his life for all of ours. Trade his sinless, perfect, 
unblemished character for our sinful, rebellious character. Trade his life for all of ours. Unlike the lamb, however, Jesus had a choice in that matter. He could have escaped his fate at any time, but he chose instead to be our sacrifice. He chose to trade his life for your life and mine. And John looked at Jesus, and in that epiphany, he saw God's sacrificial, unconditional, never-ending, reckless love for us. And finally, in his epiphany, John knew, because of all of this, John knew that he had to share the message of Jesus no matter what. No matter what it cost him, no matter what sacrifice he had to make, he had to share the message of Jesus with everyone. In verse 34, John says, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. John saw that Jesus was willing to pay any price to save all of us from death. And so John was willing to pay any price in order to point as many people to Jesus as he possibly could. And what did it cost him? Well, in in verses 37 and 38, right off the bat, we see what it cost him. We see that two of John's disciples heard his testimony and left John immediately and started following Jesus. So at first... It cost him the loss of some of his flock, at least, but it would get much worse, wouldn't it? Because not too long after that, John was thrown into prison for confronting Herod about his sin of stealing his brother's wife. And not too long after John was imprisoned, Herod had him beheaded. Just like his Savior, he paid the ultimate price for following God's will. In 2004, there was a story in the news about a woman named Karen Watson who became a Christian at the age of 29. And as she grew more and more in her faith, she felt the call to go to Iraq and serve as a relief worker with a mission group from her church. And in her, in, while in Iraq, Karen and her fellow aid workers built schools. Uh, they worked on a water purification project. She led a literacy project for widows, teaching them how to read and write in order to gain job skills to support themselves. And when the opportunity arose, she would share her faith in Jesus Christ with anyone who would listen. In March of 2004, she and all of her fellow relief workers from her church were killed by gunmen. Now, before she left, Karen had sold her home. She had sold everything she owned before she left to go to Iraq. The only thing that she left behind on this earth was one duffel bag of everyday items, and a letter for her family in case something happened to her. There is one quote from that letter that I really want you to hear. Karen wrote, I wasn't called to a place. I was called to him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. And his glory my reward. To obey was my objective, to suffer was expected, and his glory, my reward. That's Jesus' mission in a nutshell, isn't it? And it became John's mission as well. What about us, though? What about us? What about you and me? There was a time when our sin separated us entirely from God. But then Jesus came to this world. Jesus came and took away all of our sins and restored us to God and restored us 
to having eternal life. And so what I want to know and what God wants to know is what are we going to do about that? We're just going to go on with our everyday lives as if nothing is different? Are we just going to sit in a pew every week? Or are we going to take action? Are we going to do something? Are we going to make our objective complete obedience to the will of God? Because there is a world out there, friends, there is a world outside these walls that is separated from God, and they are dying every day. They are dying in their sins. And we, you and I, we have the power, not just the calling, right? Not just the responsibility and the calling by God. We have the power to point them to Christ, just as John did. We have that power, that same power has been given to you and to me that we can point others to Jesus Christ. And that leaves us with only one question. Will we? I wonder, will we? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Would you join me as we pray for our offering this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for all that you do for us. We especially thank you for sending us your Son, Jesus Christ, for restoring us in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Lord, we realize that we were dead. We were dead in sin. But because of Jesus, we have eternal life. And now you call us to go out and to spread that message to all the world, to point others to your son, Jesus Christ. That is the work that we are supposed to be about. And so, Lord, we just ask that as you place that on our hearts once again, that perhaps this time we'll listen. Perhaps this time we'll take action. God, we've brought you our, our offerings, our gifts this day, and we, we just pray that you would multiply them, that you would use those gifts to help us do exactly that, to point others to Jesus. Help us to take those gifts and use them to build up your family of faith, God, and to save others from death to their sin. Bless us, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we close uh, by singing our last song together, just a couple of things um, to lift up to you. Just as always, we invite you to read the bulletin. Uh, there are several announcements in there, uh, men's groups, women's groups, uh, happenings coming up in the life of the church. Um, also, we have a... Um, we're going to have our Valentine's Parents' Night Out that we did last year. We're going to do that again this year, and that's coming up on February 10th. We do need people to, to volunteer to help staff that. So there is a, a sign-up uh, sheet uh, in the narthex as you leave, or you can uh, talk to Andrea about that for more information. But that's coming up on February 10th. And uh, I know this is kind of down the road, but guess what? It'll be here before you know it, VBS is what I'm talking about. That's coming up in July, the 22nd to 26th. And so um, Andrea and our family ministries team and our education people, they're already uh, working on uh, not only uh, organizing that, but already working to, to get uh, volunteers and teachers and uh, others in, in place. So if you'd like to start um, thinking about that and praying about that and talking to Andrea and sign up for that as well, we'd appreciate it. And the final thing in your bulletin I want to uh, make sure that you're aware of is we have a, a special call charge conference coming up uh, next Sunday that will be at 1 o'clock in the conference room uh, to, to deal with one, uh, one item of business, uh, and that is... Uh, uh, to have a discussion about uh, taking the endowment uh, fund that has uh, that we ha currently have and uh, and eliminating that, doing away with the endowment fund and rolling that instead, rolling that into our Faith for the Future uh, campaign. And so uh, again, that's coming up at one o'clock uh, next Sunday in the conference room. Open the eyes of 
Jesus means to you with others. Point others to him. God, loving and gracious God, you have blessed us here in your house of worship this morning as we have gathered together to sing your praises. Lord, as we leave here now, I pray that you will make us just as quick to lift up your name in the world. Just as we have honored you here in this worship service with the words of our mouths, let us go out from these walls and honor you with the way we live our lives. And through our work of pointing others to your son, Jesus Christ. Go with us now, God bless us in your name and in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. God bless you all.